On The Last Recon Secrets of the Sea Part 1, the H.L. Hunley and USS Monitor, both products of the Civil War and both technologically years ahead of their time. The Monitor, an odd little ironclad ship, proved her worth famously blocking Confederate advancement at the Battle of Hampton Roads. But a storm claimed her just eight months later. It would be more than a hundred years before anyone saw the Monitor again. The real tragedy was that what enemy fire could not accomplish in the conflict with the Virginia, Mother Nature did when it sank the Monitor on the last day of 1862. The Hunley, a hand-cranked submarine with a crew of eight, delivered a fatal blow to USS Housatonic before disappearing into the Atlantic Ocean. She was finally discovered in 1995, mostly buried in sand. Crew's remains were entombed in mud inside an iron coffin, which was then buried. It took several years to figure out how to bring her up and gingerly carry her back to Charleston, where archaeologists began their amazing excavation. The first time I saw it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. So seeing this thing and knowing what it was and knowing how historically significant it was is pretty overwhelming. The wreck of the USS Monitor was elusive. Many teams searched, but it wasn't until August of 1973 that scientists aboard Duke University's research vessel Eastward finally found her. At the time, they relied upon grainy black and white photos taken with a submerged camera to confirm their find. At some point, the turret became dislodged and was lying underneath the ship, half covered by the ship and half outside of the ship. Um, uh, and again, with the ship totally inverted. It was a weird thing. The, uh, you know, the turret, as it was on the seabed, it was exposed. And it's just, you know, it's just a, it just looks like a cheese box. It's just a cylinder. Uh, and it was open on top and, and you know, it had been dug out somewhat. You could see the, and of course, it's all upside down. So you see the bottom of the gun carriages and you see some, some of the support structure. And you'd swim up to it and you'd kind of peer over the edge. And if you had to do work inside of it, sometimes you'd kind of remove your fins and get in there and brace yourself. It was very small uh, with all the, the beams and things. And we usually would have a team between like six to eight people uh, that would be on the bottom and each one of them would be in, in buddy pairs and they would have a specific task. So uh, a lot of times those were either recovering small artifacts or recording features on the wreck or doing uh, photo and video of, of particular areas so that we could know where things came from and reconstruct. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest, one of the most important things of removing artifacts is understanding where they came from on the wreck because they, they lose a lot of meaning unless you know exactly where they were located. The, the hard crust that tends to form on the outside, a lot of these big iron objects, it's called concretion. Well, we call it concretion. It's, um, it's basically hard like concrete, but it's a mix of, of sand and shell and coral and marine life and calcium. It's kind of a, a byproduct of some corrosion that forms on the artifact. How do you know it's an artifact? Like how, what can you, how do you recognize things? Yeah, so it, it is, it's really tricky uh, to sort of develop an eye for what you're looking at because you know, if you take something like uh, like a lantern, right, it has a number of different components in it. It might have glass, it might have, you know, some iron, and then it has a brass handle or something like that. So the parts that are iron typically have this concretion on them, so they just look like these bulgy, amorphous things that loosely look like the base of a lantern. Down to The Navy has notified us on our way out one morning that there were suspected remains and uh, we went down and dove on the site, and, and there, clear as day, uh, was one set of human remains. As you realize what it is, you're like, wow, that is unmistakable. And it is, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it wasn't a, a morbid thing. It was just a, it was really profound to think this is, this is a, you know, it just makes the whole story seem so much more real. It makes these things come to life, um, even though it's, you know, the antithesis of. No one had seen these individuals for, at that time it was about 140 years, and here we are, 140 years later, laying eyes on, on these guys again for the first time. And it was that, that was the point that we decided to cease all uh, uh, further excavation and actually remove the turret. Archaeologists knew the turret was a virtual time capsule and recovery would have to be delicate. And because it was flipped upside down, it was in essence resting on its roof, which was never designed to carry weight. So how do you lift 200 tons of material without having it give way and spill the contents? 
The Navy's mobile diving and salvage unit, or MUDSU, was largely responsible for removing the overburden, including armored plating designed to protect the monitor from cannon fire. Once that was out of the way, MUDSU used this specially designed spider to lift the turret. And then the excavation was continued on the surface once uh, it was out of the water. We can see kind of a, a, a commotion and a hectic situation based upon the artifacts. Um, of the two sets of human remains that were discovered in the gun turret, one of those sailors was wearing two different shoes. It's dark in there, the ship's pitching you know, side to side. Did he just grab the nearest shoes that were there, not even realizing in the dark, put them on and, and hustled up through the gun turret? We don't know. And when you have 10 to 15 foot seas splashing over the deck of the ship, you're not going to open the deck hatch. So the only way up and out of the ship that night of the sinking was through the gun turret. Other artifacts found inside the turret suggest crew members were attempting to bring along some of their valuables. Perhaps it was, OK, I've got this chest with my items. I'm bringing it up through the turret. And by the time I pop my head out and look at the conditions, forget it. I'm, le I'm not taking these things. They're too heavy. They may pull me down. We have personal items from the sailors who served and died aboard. Silverware with inscriptions, clothing, buttons, boots and shoes, pocket knives, co everyday contents that these sailors would have had aboard the night of the sinking. When you are actually able to discover something that has a sailor's initials engraved on it, and then you can go back through the crew list and actually determine who was the owner of that item, that's, that's taking the experience to a whole different level. One piece of silverware, a spoon, was inscribed with the initials JN for Jacob Nicholas. It's possible that one set of those recovered remains were his. He was 16 enlisted, um, didn't want to go on the monitor, but all of his crewmates basically you know, did, so he didn't want to be the guy that didn't, so he went aboard. Jamie Nicholas is a descendant of Jacob's. He's been able to read a series of letters exchanged between Jacob and his father in 1862. His father sent him a pack, Christmas package, and the next father is asked her kind of what he wanted. Um, the following letter, he told his father not to send it yet because uh, they were ordered to take the ship out into the ocean and come into a different bay, um, and they didn't think it was seaworthy whatsoever. They, they had all their, you know, doubts, and uh, there was a lot of praying going and everything, and uh, so that's the last that we heard from him. Forensic scientists were able to reconstruct the faces from the skulls of those remains. One of the sailors was younger, you know, 17 to 24, 25. One of them was a little bit older, probably late 20s or 30s. Um, the older sailor had a tooth that was slightly carved out from, from smoking a pipe, just from wear on it. You know, our nose, our chin and stuff, I mean, I can just see it in this guy right here. But I'm not, I don't know who's who on this picture. I'd love to know. I, I would say this guy right here really looks like him. The rotating gun turret, that remarkable 120-ton piece of 1860s engineering, is here in Newport News, Virginia, immersed in a 90,000-gallon tank. The turret, along with the steam engine, the cannons, and the carriages, are being conserved, that is, stabilized, enough to eventually be put on display at the Mariner's Museum. And our primary job here is to actually remove all of the salts that have accumulated inside of these artifacts. If we don't, if we were to, say, take a cannon, rinse it off and place it on display, all those salts that are in there are going to react with the relative humidity in the room. Um, if somebody were to walk up and touch the gun, there's salts and oils and things on their hands. Over time, those guns would fall apart. They would break into pieces. They would corrode on display. Not an option. Archaeologists are occasionally able to get a better look at the turret when the tank is occasionally drained. We know that some of the sailors actually received concussions in the gun turret during the Battle of Hampton Roads. When we go back in and excavate the sediment, we were actually able to locate dents from the cannonballs from the, from the other vessels that actually pushed the armor in and uh, potentially with the locations where those sailors were standing when they received their concussions. They also found dents where the gun carriages slammed into the back of the turret and three small holes through which they could look out at their target. Many of the items recovered prove the monitor was a sign of the Industrial Revolution about to unfold. Most people think Civil War, long time ago, fairly crude, but what we're learning is that the incredible mechanical abilities of the, of, of the, of the nation in order to produce these machines and um, the industrial capacity, people producing these pieces in different areas, shipping them to New York, um, they were all incorporated into the monitor. So it's, it's man in a struggle, but it's also a crazy machine. It's this really interesting hybrid.
Remember the Worthington pumps that struggled so mightily the night the monitor went down? That's one of them. This is um, a steam engine, actually the steam piston chamber from one of the two bilge pumps. And as you can see, it's really cracked and fragile. And so what I'm doing right now is one of the first stages is to pacify the surface, put a protective coating on, and that's why you can kind of see it's gone black. The ultimate goal is to keep moisture from entering the surface of the object. So once the object's stable, structurally, physically stable, we then go back in and try to reassemble it putting back all the small pieces. And so with objects of this size, you have to kind of do it in sections so that you can move it around. Imagine it's like a 3D jigsaw puzzle, trying to figure out where all these small fragments go. And the ultimate goal is to then reposition them in their fitting place. We can tell from the surface texture it was sand cast. We can see the parting line that runs down the whole middle of the mold. And so that's just one little story about, well, how did they do it? How did they make these things? And not only does it talk about the work of the foundry that made this, but it adds to the bigger picture of sort of that, you know, America's move from, you know, the farm to the, to the city, to the industry. There's all those little facets that, that we can tell and, and share with the public. To me, that's why it's important to save something like the monitor. Yes, it sank. Sure, it fought in a battle. It was only afloat for nine months. What's the big deal? Well, not only does it tell about the sailors who served, it tells us about life at the time how people lived, how they died, um, and it's a benchmark for the country and where we've been. Here was something revolutionary that supposedly, according to the, the history books, was the first submarine in the world to go out and sink an enemy ship and change for all times how war would be fought on the water. So she's almost a historical icon. The Hunley ended her celebrated journey from the ocean floor here at the Warren Lash Conservation Center in Charleston, South Carolina. She was immediately immersed in a 55,000 gallon treatment tank. First, a scan was made of the entire submarine, which gave archaeologists a two-scale rendering, helping them determine the best manner of access. Initially, they worked through an existing hole in one of the ballast tanks. Eventually, they pulled off the hull plates, essentially the lid on their sunken treasure chest. So we had no idea when we popped the hull plates to get inside and begin the excavation, we had no idea uh, what we were going to find. Yeah. You know, you, you come in 8 in the morning ready to work, you're gonna start excavating mud, not a clue. And there's nobody on earth that can tell you what you might find, not living at least. Delicately scraping through layers of sediment, archeologists gradually revealed fascinating artifacts, beginning with the bench the crew sat on and dozens of buttons. We had a wide assortment of buttons, plain buttons for their clothing and um, whatever uniforms they happen to have with them. We had uh, Confederate Navy, uh, Union Navy, infantry, artillery. So a wide assortment of buttons. There wasn't a uniform for the Hunley. It's just whatever branch of, this, of military service they had already been serving in, uh, they had their, uh, their, uh, their uniforms from that. About two months into the excavation, the first human remains were discovered. What followed was amazing and critical to solving the mystery. Is a crew so well preserved in their bone structure, their brains are still in their heads, we spent a lot of time and uh, tried our best to be as accurate as possible with the mapping and recording of all of the, the bones, every single bone from each crew member. After the excavation, we took all the long bones. Basically, everything except for the hands and the feet were scanned with a laser scanner. And then we made a, a reduced but one-to-one -one scale accurate 3D model of each bone and then brought it back uh, and lined them up with the points that we collected during the excavation. So you get a point there. Each crew member, a different color, dark and light. For example, the green means left and right sides. There's an entire spinal column 
that was articulated. Now obviously, and you can see the ribs still lined up. Nothing is attached anymore, but this man's torso ended up um, with his back down at the bottom of the submarine. The result, a depiction of where each crew member died. Each crewman's remains were pretty much, uh, had, they had decomposed at their stations. There wasn't a whole lot of commingling. There wasn't any evidence at all that these guys were fighting to get out. The more I looked at it, the more I realized it's almost impossible that these guys were conscious and drowning based on the disposition of their remains. Now, were they incapacitated by the explosion, um, knocked out, something like that? Uh, it's possible. Um, otherwise, we have to come up with another way for them to, to uh, die at their stations without any attempt to, to get out. It's possible they had become stuck in the mud and ran out of air. But remember, there are reports from survivors aboard the Housatonic that the submarine surfaced and signaled shore. What we're doing is, is compiling all the evidence, looking at all the clues and see what direction they point, what uh, theory of the sinking do they suggest. Do the same, we apply the same basic investigative techniques as detective work, crime scene investigators. We're doing the same thing, we're just doing it for extremely cold cases. <laughs> Captain George Dixon's story is the most chilling of cold cases. His remains were pretty well articulated. He was sitting in his seat almost like this with his hand back and he was embedded in the saddle. So we will go bring him out in, in what we call a block lift, which is with the sediment around him. Dixon, by some accounts, had a girlfriend by the name of Queenie Bennett back in Mobile, Alabama. The story went that she'd given him a gold coin when he went off to fight in the Confederate infantry in 1861. And he carried it with him at the Battle of Shiloh on April the 6th, 1862. He was shot in his left side, but the shot was deflected by that gold coin that was in his left pocket. But so far, the historical fable was thought by many to be nothing more than romantic fancy. Marie Jacobson was the archaeologist in charge of lifting Dixon out of the wreck. So Maria Jacobson got in there and slid in the mud and put her hands under his pelvic regions to make sure that we had him disengaged. When she did, she felt the cold ridge of the coin on his left side remains. I got it. Really? Say the word. <laughs> I have the, the gold coin. No idea. Yeah. You feel it in your fingers? Oh, I feel it in my fingers. Oh, I do. Oh, Good my God. Good right. Ah, uh, cold gems. Get cheeks. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, oh my man, God. I got chill bumps. On the coin is inscribed Shiloh, 1862. My life preserver, G-E-D. When we pulled the coin, the coin is warped. It's bent. The lead is still on Lady Liberty's bonnet where the shot struck. And when we looked at George Dixon's remains, he has the calcium deposits here on his bone where the coin was pushed into his flesh. In his right pocket, an 18 karat gold brooch embedded with 38 diamonds and a Kentucky colonel ring bearing eight diamonds, one of them a full carat. This is Dixon's watch. Uh, the gold pocket watch was found well in his pant pockets. And on the fob, he has his name engraved and his Mason chapter. It says George E. Dixon Mobile <coughs> chapter number 40. It wasn't that difficult to conserve gold because it's gold. So it doesn't corrode like uh, other materials, other metals will do. But we have the interior mechanism and that was a big challenge because the mechanism we have the porcelain dial, we have the iron hands, we have all interior brass and all kinds of metals. Components must each be treated differently, and textiles, in this case, Dixon's clothing, are a particular challenge. The entire textile will be just draped on his body. The clothing was the consistency of toilet paper. Johanna painstakingly used water and syringes to remove sediment from the material. He was very fancy, as you know, so he was wearing cashmere. My problem in conserving him is that he's a uh, jacket and vest are both made of cashmere and I think they're matching cashmere. So it's really hard for me to figure out what is what. These are drawings of Dixon's block lift as it was removed from the sub. They work as a sort of map as Joanna tries to put the captain's suit back together. Now this used to, used to be really red, 
when I excavate it, but light unfortunately affects a lot of the materials. The vest is beginning to take shape. This is the bottom line, and those two holes there was where the bottoms were. And here, uh, this is the chest line, and it goes like this. We have that missing area over there. This is the neckline. That's where the arm goes. Remember the unlit candle in the second sinking of the Hunley? It appears this crew's only source of light was on board and intact. And it was completely covered in sediment. It was concreted. Some uh, part of the candle was fused to the hole, which is why we have this very dark orangey red type of material. That's removed the candle out of the holder. And unfortunately, I can't remove the wig. So this, this one is going to be treated in a way that it's going to be safe both for the wig and for the wax. And also the candle was, wasn't really burned that much, so it was a little bit burned, but we will have traces of wax in the holder if it would have burned for a long time, but we don't. Okay. So it was barely used. Right, so it tells the story of they hadn't been down very long. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of the most telling finds discovered in late 2012 was under a brittle layer of concretion at the end of the spar. Remains of the copper sleeve used to attach the so-called torpedo. You can also see the, uh, the peel back effect of that copper. Again, that's not from physical trauma, that's the force of a detonation. Uh, the shock wave of the explosion blew back the copper as the torpedo destroyed itself. And so since we have this remains on the end of the uh, spar, we're 100% sure that the torpedo was detonated uh, while still attached to the end of the spar. And that's a big clue for us. That means the detonation initially took place within 18 feet of the submarine, and the crew fully expected to survive the blast. The casing also confirms the explosive was an Edgar Singer design which, according to historical drawings, contains 135 pounds of gunpowder and was detonated with a trigger mechanism. The crew is known to have conducted tests using half the charge, and the wooden hull of the Housatonic could have created more blowback. So doubling the size of your charge and placement could have possibly had some negative effects for the, the submarine hull or crew. We don't know. Keep in mind, though, there's been no damage found on the submarine caused by the explosion. Did they do, as some of the witnesses said, it backed up, disappeared into the dark after the explosion? Was it anchored out there? Did they throw that grapple hook out, and was the rope too short, and did it pull the Hunley under and trap it? And did they have anoxia and just boom, blackout? We don't know yet, but we will know. Even after 150 years, the nation's commitment to bring you home is as good today as it was during the Civil War. Before, it was pretty remarkable that they honored these guys in that way after such a long amount of time has elapsed. On March 8, 2013, the 151st anniversary of the Battle of Hampton Roads, the remains of the two sailors recovered from USS Monitor were laid to rest. However, having raised those remains, we brought them here to the National Military Cemetery founded during the same great conflict for which they gave, in President Lincoln's words, their last full measure of devotion. It was kind of nice, though, to see it concluded. The site where about 80% of the Monitor wreck still lies is now a National Marine Sanctuary, another first. The remains of 14 other men may still be buried there. This is something that I can assure you the crew of the Monitor back in 1862 never would have imagined they'd be involved with. But in the end, that sacrifice and that contribution may be as, as equally as, as effective and powerful as, as what they did on March 9th uh, in helping us to, to be better citizens and uh, caretakers of the sea. Until 2011, the H.L. Hunley sat at the same 45-degree angle at which she landed on the ocean floor in 1864. Once the artifacts were recovered, she was rotated upright. She's undergoing preservation, and archaeologists are figuring out how to safely put her on display. Her crew received a burial service in line with the crew who went before them. You could hear the clump of the horses and the soldiers passing by in the coffins. And it was like going back 
to the burial that was given to Har Sunley. All three crew remains now lie at Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston. Meantime, archaeologists and historians continue their work solving the mystery of the H.L. Hunley. The Hunley is like a giant jigsaw puzzle, but Chief Barry jealously has held on to that last secret. 